Hello, welcome back to Astro Art Global Astronomy Month 2013. My name is Richard Klar. I'm an artist and collaborator on the Astro Art team. I'd like to introduce you first to Dr. Pamela Gay, the director of CosmoQuest, uh, who's producing this show. This is a collaboration of Astronomers Without Borders and CosmoQuest. Uh, I'd also like to introduce you to our artist this evening, uh, Daniela DePaulis. She's uh, the chair of the Astro Art Committee, and she will be presenting her video work, uh, The Voyage Don La Lune. Um, I'm going to say a few words about the, uh, the video itself before we get started. Uh, Le Voyage Dans la Lune, 9 minutes 48 seconds, created 2011 to 2012, is um, a black and white film inspired by the homonymous George Millet's movie. The animation is composed of 26 moon bounce images of the lunar phase, kindly provided by Michael Oates, Manchester Astronomical Society. On the 20th September 2011, the 26 images were sent to the moon in a sequence, one after the next, as radio signals by Bruce Halas, a radio amateur in Brazil. The radio signals reflected by the rough moon surface and scattered all over were partly received by Jan van Neulwink at Dwingeloo Radio Telescope, a 30 meters dish in the Netherlands. The original signals traveled approximately 768,000 kilometers, the distance to the moon and back, losing some data on the way, thus giving the moon bounced images a very unique appearance. This work has been realized using visual moon bounce, a technology conceived by Daniela de Paulus, the author of The Voyage Down the Moon, as a new application of moon bounce. This is a technology used from 1946 by the United States Military Navy as a form of reliable radio communication and also during the Cold War as an espionage tool. Uh, moon bounce was replaced by artificial satellites in the late 50s. However, radio as amateurs still employed as a playful form of international communication. On December 6, 2009 visual artist Daniela de Paulus, together with radio amateur Jan van Muehlwing and the Cameras Association of Dwingaloo Radio Telescope sent for the first time in history an image to the moon and back. Visual moon bounce has been widely used by the artist in her project Optics, a live performance between the earth and the moon. Uh, the website is www.optics.info, and optics is spelled O-P-T-I-C-K-S. The Voyage Down the Loon is the second work she realized with this form of communication via the moon. The sound of the video has been produced by JAXA, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. The sound is called Moon Bell and uses data from one of the sensors of the lunar orbiting satellite, Selene Kaguya, a laser altimeter transforming the altitude data into musical interviews. The area sonified in the moon, in the voyage down the moon, is on the far side of the moon, starting at the Korolev crater across the highest point. The very slow version of the sound suggests the rhythmic steps of someone walking on the moon. This video is the first attempt to use moon bounce with moving images, and it's the only work of its kind in the world. So I will now turn this over to Daniela, and I will also say that uh, I'll see you after the screening for a question and answer period with the artist. Thanks, Richard, uh, for the wonderful introduction, and uh, thanks uh, to everyone watching from yeah. uh, home today. Um, well, as Richard said, uh, this is the first attempt to use this technology that I pioneered with a team of radio amateurs in the Netherlands. So um, it's a, an experimental film that I usually show as a video installation. 
uh, it uh, lasts 10 minutes and um, uh, I'm very interested in knowing your feedback at the end and uh, to answer your questions if you have any. Before the start of the film I have a few images to show you for those of you who are completely new um, to the new uh, to the moon bounce technology so if uh, please um, Pamela if you can please show the first image um, thank you um, I will start my short introduction this is uh, an image that um, should give you an idea of what moon bounce is about um, it's um, the very first form of satellite communication uh, developed as Richard said uh, after the Second World War it uses the moon as a natural satellite. The, the communication allows two locations on Earth to send uh, messages, uh, vocal uh, Morse code messages, and um, the, uh, the, the new form of technology that I pioneered allows also to send uh, visual data. If we scroll to the next image, i like to show you what my inspiration for the development of what now I call visual moon bounce uh, was uh, originally was. It's this image left in 1972 by astronaut Charles Duke. Uh, he left this picture of his family on the moon and uh, this image has been on the moon surface ever since. So the idea uh, that inspired my research on um, visual moon bounce was to uh, was the possibility of sending images to the moon and receive them back. In the following slide, uh, I would like to show you the instrument that I used, which uh, Richard uh, already mentioned, is the Dwingelo radio telescope. It's a, a large dish in the north of the Netherlands, used uh, only for uh, amateur radio experiments and. Uh, also art experiments. Finally, uh, the last image before the screening. It's the, this image which uh, for me is the uh, visual representation of uh, mm -hmm. this technology. Uh, it's a um, visual moon balance. It's very much of a, a visual journey to the moon and back. So. Uh, it allows to send our thoughts, our um, well, uh, an image um, that we would like to uh, address to the moon and back. Um, and I always show this picture because um, somehow it's an iconic image, and uh, it's uh, the best representation for me of uh, the uh, visual journey to the moon and back. Okay, I think that's it, and um, you. I would uh, suggest to watch this video on Vimeo uh, for higher resolution. Okay, I'll see you back later after okay. the screen. Okay, good, thank you.
Thank you, Daniela, for the presentation. That was really uh, an outstanding work, very interesting, and I'm sure there'll be uh, some good questions uh, following. Is there something you would like to add more to this? 
Um, yes. First of all, I hope that people somehow manage to see the film in a higher resolution because the connection seems to be particularly slow today. And um, the, the sound, at least on my side, was not uh, as uh, crystal clear as it should be. Mm -hmm. So uh, the sound actually is a very important part of the work because it's very sculptural. And uh, as you said, Richard, is really meant to suggest the footstep of someone on the moon. Uh, the pitches of the sound, the low and the high pitches, are uh, corresponding to the uh, topography of the moon surface. So the high pitches are uh, suggesting a higher surface, and the, um, the low pitches a, a deep, um, a deeper area of the moon. So uh, I hope that you could appreciate the sound. And um, uh, also, just a, a few more words about the distortion of the images. The highly pixeled quality of the image is caused, of course, by the long journey that these images have to travel to the moon and back. So uh, the, the radio signals uh, become much weaker when they return back on, uh, on Earth. And uh, most of these radio signals are scattered all around the place, so only very small part of these uh, radio signals com comes back to Earth. I, th I think for me that, by the way, the sound on this end was great. The sound was, was perfect. The sound was beautiful. And for, for me, the noise or distortion in the images, to me, adds a very beautiful element. It's sort of like an impressionist painting. And it's just, I mean, that's, that's the artistic part of it, certainly a very important artistic uh, component. And I guess I wanted to, to ask you uh, if it would be possible to, to transmit the same image to the moon and back at different times and get the same results, or would the results always be different because of various atmospheric conditions or what have you? Yes, the, the images are really unique. Uh, Every time we send an image, is uh, the image is a, a very unique footprint of the radio condition of the uh, cosmos of, at the time of transmission and reception. Every time we send this image, in fact, uh, the astronomical condition are uh, very peculiar of that particular moment, and the uh, radio waves that are continuously crossing the space uh, changes, so um, we will always get a different result. Even if I moon bounce these images uh, many times, I will always have a different result. Yes, okay, and, and assuming that the topography of the moon would have something to do too with the type of image that comes back, because given the location on the moon where the radio waves hit the moon, depending on the topography, the way the signal was reflected back, wouldn't that be different to some extent? I think the, that would make a big difference because when we uh, beam these images to the moon, uh, the radio wave, uh, the radio waves hit the entire moon surface. So it's not only one particular spot of the moon that uh, gets hit. Uh, but the main cause of the distortion is, of course, the fact that the moon is a sphere. So the radio waves are reflected uh, very badly by the moon surface, and on top of that, they are. Uh, refracted all around the space. So the radio waves of these images are still traveling into the outer space. Okay, thank you. Oh, I, I would like to remind people we would, we would welcome any questions that you have and uh, you can ask your questions on, you, on the YouTube feed, uh, the event page, and Twitter with the hashtag pound sign, G-A-M-A, -A, Astro Art. So please send us your questions and send Daniela whatever questions you have, and I'm sure she'll be happy to uh, answer them. And, and perhaps uh, you, Dr. Gay, maybe have some questions or something you'd like to ask Daniela? 
I, I just find this fascinating. Uh, it's it's a way of taking lunar laser ranging and turning mm -hmm. it into an art form. Yes, it is. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you probably refer to the recent experiment that NASA did, uh, Pamela. Well, the... so so for for decades, actually, one of the things that that scientists have been doing is reflecting laser light off of reflectors on the moon and also off of satellites, and they do this to measure the distance to the moon down to the millimeter, and so we can actually measure how the moon is gradually moving away from the Earth. This is a highly sophisticated. Uh, science in terms of all the technology that goes into it but its idea is what you're doing you you shine a light they use optical light you shine a light off the moon and then you measure it coming back you're sending a radio signal which is just a color of light reflecting it off of the moon yeah. and capturing it when it comes back they're making high resolution measurements of distance and you're making beautiful art. I love the fact that the same concept in science can be used for so many different things. Yes, thanks Pamela. I think uh, your uh, uh, scientific point of view is really uh, important. Um, yes, my original idea in fact was to use laser uh, when I had this idea of beaming images to the moon but um, uh, well, mm -hmm. the uh, the easiest way to do this is by using uh, radio waves. Uh, we don't have access to uh, huge uh, laser transmitter, so um, it's it was a bit of a compromise. Also, um, when I spoke about my idea to my collaborators in the Netherlands, uh, we also discussed the possibility of doing this by laser. But I um, I also remember this experiment that was made I think earlier on this year in January 2013 when NASA beamed this image of the Mona Lisa painting uh, on one of this uh, I think on um, to the lunar reconnaissance orbiter and they used the uh, laser technology and uh, they mm -hmm. received a very pixeled image which somehow reminded me a lot of these moon bounced images, although the technology of course is completely different, but I think conceptually there is something which can be um, also compared with what I do. And what's, what's nice about the way you do it is you can engage so many more parts of the world because with a laser you shoot it up and because the laser light, the wavelengths are so tiny you have to shoot it off of a reflector and you catch it back with the same telescope that you sent the Im image with and, and it's much less satisfying than what you're doing with the radio waves which are much longer wavelengths of light and then you can cap capture them somewhere different than where you sent them from. Yes, definitely. Um, this is a very much uh, a part of the work, uh, the interaction of the radio amateurs in the, uh, in the work itself. And uh, the reason why I wanted to show this video for Global Astronomy Month is because uh, for the last uh, two editions of Global Astronomy Month I presented uh, optics as a live performance. And uh, during this performance, I beam to the moon and back images that are uh, submitted by the audience and by the public uh, that uh, follows uh, Astronomers Without Borders. So we always had a great fun by, during the performance and beaming these images. But at the moment, the radio telescope is undergoing restoration. So um, I thought of uh, feeling the... Um, the well, uh, the gap of this uh, performance, which hopefully will happen next year, by showing this work, which is uh, a, of course a recorded uh, version of this visual moon bounce technology. Well, Danielle, the, the piece is certainly uh, it's it's inspirational. It's it's a wonderful work of art, and it reaches out to people on on so many levels. And like Pamela was saying, it it, it definitely creates that bridge between the artist and the art of the arts and science and technology. And it's a wonderful combination of all of those uh, disciplines. And I think um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from the Swiss abstract expressionist Paul Klee, who said, and I paraphrase this from the German translation, that art 
does not reproduce the visible, rather it makes visible that which is not visible. And that is what you're doing with the moon balance and with your work. So it's very beautiful. Thank you, Richard. I okay. appreciate these comments from you, especially knowing that you have uh, so much experience in uh, art and space-related topics. So I think uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. So ha do we have any questions coming in? No, we don't. But, but one interesting thing I'd like to point out is these radio signals that are getting sent out and reflected off the moon quite purposely. These, these are radio loud. These are enhanced signals. And when our television signals, our cell phone signals, they leak out into outer space, these, these are much um, fainter signals that are traveling out among the stars. So when you imagine uh, alien civilizations perhaps listening to the first television broadcast from Earth, they're going to be as pixelated and as smeared out as we're seeing with these, but even many times more so. So you can imagine NBC, CBS, all of these different channels layered on top of each other with bits of the images torn out by the atmosphere in the process. So we're not sending clear broadcasts, but we are sending what we perceive as art out quite accidentally among the stars. So maybe aliens watching and receiving those transmissions will say, gee, I wonder why they watch that stuff. It doesn't look very good. I, I think <laughs> they'll probably understand what was happening in the process. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Let's hope they also understand art. <laughs> Yes well, yes, well, if they're advanced, hopefully they will. And if they're primitive too, because you don't really have to be that advanced. If you look back at the cave paintings, and that seems to be one of our basic instincts to express ourselves. And we express ourselves with the tools that we have at hand. And I, I, I think my feeling is that if Rembrandt were alive today, certainly Michelangelo, Leonardo, that they would be using the tools of today to create art. They're wonderful tools, and there's such a great potential there. So it's, to me, it's all very exciting. OK. So what are your next plans, Daniela? Oh, the next plan, uh, oh, thanks for asking, Pamela. I, this is something I'm working on at the minute, is to uh, use this, um, well, develop this um, well, there are different plans. I'm making actually a holographic print out of these images. Um, so the 26 images are now becoming a holographic print. Print. I'm very much fascinated by the holographic principles um, and uh, the huge potential in um, changing completely our perception of reality and. Uh, whatever surrounds us. So I'm experimenting a little bit with that concept, but um, also I'm um, working um, towards developing this performance and using brain waves. So my next step will be also sending brain waves into outer space, uh, perhaps also moon bouncing them, either as as electronic signals or as images. So I'm currently working with a, a neurologist uh, trying to develop this possibility. And um, I think that would be um, the next step. Um, my initial idea was, in fact, to send uh, thoughts into other space. So uh, giving people the possibility to transmit their thoughts uh, to whoever is there to listen to. A great idea. Daniela, would these be transmitted in real time or would they be recorded first and then transmitted? Uh, no, ideally uh, in real time. So I would like to implement this possibility into my current uh, optics performance. So I would like to have a device in the performance space where people can uh, connect directly with the radio telescope that they use in the Netherlands. And uh, so that these uh, brain waves can be transmitted into in real time into outer space. 
Sounds like a very interesting project. And do you have an idea when you'll be able to do this? Uh, well, I think as soon as the radio telescope reopens, so hopefully within the next two months, uh, we will start doing the first test of this um, of this concept of this idea. We need obviously a very um, stable equipment, so the radio telescope is really ideal for this. Okay, and if I remember correctly, the brain waves are, are rather low frequency or ultra low frequency. Is that correct? Um, well, I um, as long as we can convert these brain waves into images uh, or yes. into sounds, then they can easily be transmitted using the um, radio, radio telescope, which operates at 23 centimeter, which is um, short waves. Yes. So, so the trick here is that they're using some sort of an electroencephalogram to measure the uh, oscillations of different wavelengths in, in the brain, the modulations of the signals through the neurons. And they're taking these modulations and converting them to a different color. So it's sort of like you can imagine someone pulsing a blue light. Well, you can pulse a red light the exact same way you pulse the blue light, and all you've done is change the color, not the pulsing. So they're taking those modulations of, of the, the neurons firing in the brain, converting it to this radio wavelength, and sending out the modulated signal. Yes, okay. Yes, exactly. Fantastic. <laughs> Well, it sounds like a wonderful project. Thanks. Yeah. I hope it will uh, it will work fine because at the moment, uh, when uh, you don't you cannot practice uh, technically these ideas, uh, of course, uh, conceptually sounds uh, like a great potential. But uh, of course, when uh, you face the technological problem, then sometimes the concept changes, and you mm -hmm. have to work around it. So we'll see yes. when the telescope reopens. Yes. Uh, I have a question, another question for Pamela. What does it take, or is it possible to get uh, a crater on the moon named after Daniela? <laughs> it, it, uh, that is a complicated <laughs> issue. Um, it, it's the, the trick is you find a scientist who's willing to write a paper about a crater and name the, name the crater in the paper. Um, and am then I it, and then I it talking usually, to one? I I I'm I I'm not someone who does that. I have to admit. Okay. Um, but but stay tuned. This is this is an evolving field. How you get things <laughs> named. The okay. easiest way to get something named is to find an asteroid. And if you know anyone who finds asteroids, um, you have a great name for an asteroid. Okay. Well, it just seemed like with Daniela's work and being so involved with the moon and, and really being a pioneer in this area of moon balance, that it just seems like obviously there should be a crater on the moon named after her. Well, Richard, thanks so much. I think that would be wonderful. But uh, connecting to what Pamela said about the asteroids, um, it's possible also to do this uh, radio waves bounce of. Uh, asteroids, so not with images, but with sound. With sound. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, I've been listening to some of these sounds that uh, ham radio operators uh, bounce yes. off uh, asteroids, and they're incredibly interesting. Um, so uh, there is a lot of potential there to express artistically all this um, movement of the celestial bodies out there and, uh, and in the future maybe we'll be able to talk about uh, Venus bounds, Mars bounds or whoever, you know. Um. Yeah. And what's, yeah. what, what, what's particularly interesting is if you do this with an asteroid as it passes by the Earth, as yes. it's coming towards us it adjusts the sound in one direction and as it's moving away it adjusts it in the other. So you can yeah. actually hear it, it, it get more like it, it's uh, the sound has inhaled helium and, and then as it goes away it goes the opposite sure. direction. So you have these changes in pits, yeah. you have sounds that drop out, so it, it's an interesting complicated change to what sure. you're doing. That's very interesting. I, I had not heard of that for 
projecting sound off of an asteroid. But it, is it predictable? I know with the moon, you're dealing with a curved surface, so you project, you're hitting at one angle, and I think you can project where it's going to come back to Earth, where you would pick it up. But on an asteroid where you have such a irregular surface, can you tell where the signal will be reflected? Let's say you transmit something from Dwingaloo, can you tell what region on Earth where you'd be able to pick it's, up that signal? It's going to hit the whole Earth. I mean, the, the, the thing about these is um, the beam, it spreads out as it goes towards the asteroid, and then the entire asteroid will end up getting hit at once pretty much, and okay. then it reflects back to Earth, and you just have to listen to pick it up, but... Mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 a complex art to do this. It's it's we do radar mapping of different asteroids, and we've gotten fairly sophisticated at figuring out how to do this. And this is yes. very similar to radar mapping, except instead of sending a radar signal that is just mm -hmm. a beep 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 beep, we're mm -hmm. sending out a much more complicated signal. Sounds very interesting. Yes, the radio amateurs are actually very uh, knowledgeable of all these astronomical phenomena, especially those who work with uh, these uh, 23 centimeter waves. So they know how to track these asteroids. Um, mm -hmm. My collaborators only a few days ago um, managed to reflect radio signals of the ISS. So it's uh, just a matter of uh, finding a very, very uh, short uh, time span during which you can do these kind of experiments. Um, so yeah, uh, they, they need a lot of also scientific background in order to do that. So the name amateurs, uh, I think it's more, uh, it's referring more to the fact that they have a strong passion for this kind of technology rather than to the fact that they have a, a, a basic uh, knowledge of technological thing, which is not the case. I mean, they're incredibly uh, skilled. Uh, even, I think, um, Joe Taylor, who is a, uh, a Nobel Prize winner, a very important uh, radio astronomer, He's mm -hmm. also uh, a well-known ham radio operator, and uh, so are many astronauts. So uh, mm -hmm. there is a huge technological and scientific uh, knowledge behind that. Yeah, what's, what's really kind of amazing is we've, not I personally, but um, people who are ham radio operators have been bouncing signals off of satellites since the earliest days of launching things into space. So this is something that the ham radio operators really have all the expertise to do. And um, moving forward, there, there's no reason to think that will change. And so the amateur professional dichotomy is strictly amateurs get to buy whichever cool toys they want and they don't get paid for what they do. Professionals yes. have to hope and pray they get the instruments they want, but they yeah. get paid to do the job. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I didn't realize that you could bounce a signal off a satellite, so it doesn't interfere with the functioning of the satellite? No. No. No, and uh, uh, even aeroplanes can be a target. Uh, there are all kinds of things. Uh, I mean, I don't know exactly all the different ranges of um, ham radio targets, but uh, any, even mountains, as far as I know, can be used as a target. So mm -hmm. they're incredibly creative in their hobby. It sounds like how small an object could you bounce a radio signal off of? That depends on the wavelength of the light that you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, you pretty much need, I, I think that you need the object to be at least one quarter of a wavelength in size. So uh, 21 centimeter, for instance, that means you need an object that's at least five, five centimeters in size. Yes, that's pretty small. And uh, independently yeah. of the distance from the uh, transmitter or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's independently, but I mean, clearly, a bigger yeah. object will reflect more wavelengths, and ideally, you want it to be a full wavelength. Yes. So, it's the more wavelengths you have, the better it's going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for answering my question. Mm. 
So we have uh, W Wench Nine on on YouTube is is asking if uh, the the effect that we talked about with as the asteroid goes past it changes the pitch of the sound if that's the Doppler effect. Yes, yes, that's the Doppler effect, and that's also the same way that uh, police officers measure how fast your car is going and it's going yeah. past. Yes, and uh, if I can add something to this, uh, one of the reason of the distortion of the moon bounced images is the Doppler effect. So, um, because of the rotation of the Earth, while we send the image, uh, the radio waves that we receive um, as a reflection are obviously distorted also by this, this continuous movement. So, the Doppler effect also applies to the visual moon bounce. Hmm. Okay. Are there any other questions? No, not right now. Okay. So tomorrow, how much, yes. Uh, yeah. Richard, tomorrow we are continuing this discussion about space art. Yes, we have the panel discussion uh, that begins at the same time at eighteen hundred hours uh, universal time, and that will be uh, a little longer in length. We will have. Uh, Roger Molina, Daniela DePaulis, and myself participating. And the subject will be art since Sputnik. And we'll be talking about uh, how space art has developed in that time since uh, Sputnik was first launched. And two of the participants actually saw Sputnik while it was orbiting the Earth. And if that makes any difference, <laughs> so yeah, should be an in, should be an interesting discussion. We hope that whoever's watching tonight will be able to uh, join us tomorrow. So that's at 11 a.m. Pacific time uh, in uh, Europe. It would be uh, 8 p.m. and Universal time at uh, 1800 hours or 6 p.m. So we okay. hope you'll be, be able to join us. And are we wrapping up now? Or okay, well, I, you know, I'd like to thank you, Daniela, for your wonderful presentation. And it was truly inspirational to hear you talk about your work and to see your wonderful video. And it was great to have uh, you, Pamela, on board and to have your comments. So I think we had uh, a good evening and a good discussion and look forward to uh, having more discussions like this, certainly in the near future. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you. hope to see you again.